So as I was saying, this uh, I wanted you to mull about, consider and ponder, what are you looking at? I'm sure that in your previous studies, you've encountered many of the aspects of what you're going to see here in computational modeling and dynamical systems. Uh, definitely in courses like computational science, if you if you had it with me, but uh, also in the broad spectrum of nanobiology. So as uh, we tell ourselves, so nanobiology is not necessarily about things being um, microscopic or nanoscopic, but more about using mathematics to explain biology, mathematics and physics to understand and explain biology. And never was it more true than here in this, uh, this course and in the masters. So what do you think you're looking at? If you want to, uh, if you're always welcome to join. Actually, I had an idea, look at me being illuminated. It's been so long since we had the quarantine that I almost uh, don't think about these things anymore. You have the Zoom chat. So if you join in Zoom, uh, I then can uh, I then can hear your uh, your questions in the chat. Isn't that a lovely idea? I'm trying to I don't know how to turn off the the waiting room though. Let me see if I can disable the waiting room. Okay. Uh, didn't... Francesca, you wanted to say something to me? No, I was just trying to turn off the waiting room. Ah, thank you. <laughs> okay. So, ah, before I go forward to the next slide in which I introduce myself once again, for most of, uh, most of you, I think that I've already met. Um, but uh, here we see the feeding currents of the Patidia miniata, the starfish larvae. And this looks beautifully, uh, I think you notice, like a vector field, right? And so the this little embryo as it's growing, the, the, the larva as it's growing, it is inducing some specific currents to make sure that uh, its surface is properly tended uh, by nutrients in, uh, in copious amount. But more interestingly, these trajectories that the individual uh, nutrient particles uh, are taking, they are continuous and uninterrupted. Uh, this is going to relate later to a theorem that we're going to be uh, to be discussing when in, later in week five in the course. The uh, continuity theorem, and what I wanted to just impress upon you here is that despite the fact that this larvae doesn't know anything about maths, it's inducing something uh, very, a pattern very specific to optimize a certain problem. Now, okay, I've introduced you to the starfish lava, and I'm going to quickly introduce myself to you once again. Um, so I'm Mario Negrello, and uh, what I do for a living is computational neuroscience at the, uh, at the Erasmus Medical Center. And I've studied in a vast variety of, of these fields. So like I uh, had my PhD in the topics of evolutionary robotics. You like Evo Devo, and so do I. I've used Evo Devo principles to develop recurrent neural networks that controlled robots. Uh, also studied reinforcement learning at the time. And particularly, I've applied the notions that you learn in this course to study the dynamical systems that the recurrent neural networks in these robots embedded. So here you see the dynamics of recurrent neural networks. And one core concept of what you're going to be seeing in this lecture is the idea of parameter space analysis to try to understand the qualitative changes that happen in the behavior of a system as you smoothly change parameters. So these words are going to become second nature to you by the end of this. And uh, if you look just on the one below, um, you've noticed that these concepts are now used in high level and sophisticated models of the cerebellar system uh, that we are developing also in the computational neuroscience department. Now I see some people walking out because um, they see that I'm recording <laughs> no, or they're going to the front, to the front rows. Oh, that's also nice. Um, 
so apologies i'm noticing too much here um i was going to say that in the dynamics of the cerebellum first of all this is a colleague of yours who is now my phd student called leonard lensmeyer He's, uh, he's put together this animation of our most recent model of the inferior olive of the cerebellum of the mouse. And the principles under, underlying it, so the biophysical principles underlying it, give rise to high level dynamical phenomena that we're going to be discussing here. So even though this is a piece of brain with hundreds of thousands of uh, neurons, and these neurons have compartments, you can use the tools that we're going to be learning about here to analyze its behavior, particularly in the context of coupled oscillators. So we're going to be talking about phenomena such as synchrony and so forth and so on. The lecture that I had planned for today had two components. The first one is uh, an introduction to the topics of dynamical systems, just a taxonomy of the, uh, of the grand scheme of things, let's say so that I give you a mindset of how you're going to go into it. At the end of it, we're going to be talking about the specifics of the course, like how much effort you're supposed to, uh, to, to devote to it um, and its structure. You probably now know that we're going to be dealing with Jupyter Notebooks and projects that you're going to be working on your own. And so I'm going to, I'm going to describe that towards the end of the lecture. Okay. Um, if you want to know more about dynamics of brains and uh, how they tie in with the study of dynamical systems, so there, these are two books on the topic, uh, self-promotion. Um, I think that might be useful, particularly the computational modeling of the brain. It's not, I didn't write it by myself. I'm just one of the editors. We, we bundle together uh, a great set of contributions on the topic of modeling the brain across many scales. And one surprising thing that turns out is that across all the scales, it feels as if dynamical systems is just a way to look at it. Um, I hope that you will agree with me that, uh, that this is going to be a useful tool for your toolbox, irrespective of you pursuing this particular uh, thread. And uh, let, uh, let us move forward with what a course is like. Usually I have this part more interactive, but as I mentioned, this uh, is challenging in this setting. So computational modeling and dynamical systems is about coding simulators. So you've been gorging your eyes in the visual beauty of, of simulators in general. And nanobiology has introduced you to a, a large set of models so far. And many of these have like very enticing visualizations. So this is another moment in which you can exercise your own creativity with respect to the visualization of models of, phenomena, of biological phenomena to study complex dynamics. Now, the reasons why we model, which I would inquire you, and I feel like intuitively you as nanobiologist, you have, you have it in your hearts already. Clearly, partially is because models help us understand phenomena, even the simple and complex. Model help us deal with the complexity. We make complex models and then suddenly simplicity emerges from the complexity. They provide a unified framework for discussion, they give us the words with which we can speak. And they say, oh, you've, you've assumed this particular number of uh, uh, this particular physical constant here. This is contentious. At least now we have a language to talk about it, right? So if someone criticizes your model, then they have specifics to point at, and then we can talk about it. That's the exact idea. We unpack it. Models can generate novel predictions things that you didn't know. You cobble up a sufficiently complex system and stuff comes out that wasn't there previously. Um, if model must, you know, models are all wrong, as you've probably heard by now, but if they must be modified to account for the new data, you see what's necessary to change. So it's the interaction between modeling phenomenon, modeling and experiment that really bring the mind together. The mind is also a modeling device. I would like to think uh, of yourself to, I would like yourselves to think about yourselves as 
modeling machines. When we're creating a piece of language that embodies a phenomenon that describes it to ourselves, that is, in a sense, a model. We're trying to make better models that are more formal, more predictive, more consistent uh, with, with phenomena, but really the interaction, the necessary changes to make the model better or to make it fit to certain, uh, to certain outputs, that's the essence. Now, this is a little bit of a difference between statistical models and in statistical models, you sometimes have many parameters and you can fit any curve. But that's not the notion here. In dynamical systems, we're trying to find mechanism. And in mechanism, we're trying to represent the causal interactions of reality. So we, we do computational modeling because we want to improve and reinforce or maybe even contradict the predictions from verbal theories because those can be tenuous due to lack of specificity and flexibility of vague verbal constructs. What I mean by this is that, say, in neuroscience, you, there's a lot of papers published with excellent data and beautiful results, interesting experiments, but ringing a theory in words is easier than making sure that you make a modeling, computational modeling counterpart that actually expresses not only what you see, not only the phenomenon or the parts of the phenomenon that you chose to describe, but its entire spectrum. And so models in general, they allow for the control and selection of the relevant observables and hidden variables. So it's about selection. Like in modeling, often it's about what you put in. And sometimes you have to put in a lot of stuff. You saw, if you saw the cerebellar model that I just shown you, this is a model that might strike you as a bit uh, iffy. You, you saw like so many neurons. I mean, how can you assume every single neuron has so many ion channels and in a single neuron has all these proteins? I mean, aren't you, uh, isn't this large scale model? Um, too unparameterized well the beauty is and we wouldn't uh we wouldn't do it if there were it wouldn't be stepwise fail uh fail safes and sanity checks that we made to know which variables we can include and understand and which uh, which variables we should so the variables and the parameters in the model they acquire causal roles and it's through their causal roles that we then interpret them, change them, and verify them, explain them, and create these modeling counterparts. Now, I don't think I have to sell uh, computational modeling for you because this is a compulsory course. But I feel like if I give you a few views of how this has helped me look into, into their value, um, I would uh, also be sharing with you the value that you're going to gain from studying this. And nowhere but in function and form, uh, the study of morphogenesis and dynamics uh, are um, dynamical systems more prevalent. I'm going to give you a few examples of pattern generation models now. And this is the motivation part of the course. So let us discuss complex adaptive and dynamical systems for a little while. So a system, uh, as many of you will know, uh, is a, a collection of organized things, a whole composed of relationships amongst its members. So it is a, um, it's an organized whole, right? So you have many little elements and that's a system. Now the, the solar system is a system. Actually, it happens to be also a dynamical system where the future is determined by the rules that are embodied in physics. Right? So dynamical systems uh, are, are extrapolations from, from these models. The trick is often to discover what are the laws governing the appearance of system and form. So what the rules are, are dependent on what they are. And so the systems, the, com the components embody the rules. So dynamical systems are those that have a set of formal rules that determine it, their future. So you have a, 
uh, in the case, for example, of the solar system, you have a set of equations representing the position and velocity of all of the uh, all of the masses, and they give us intense predictability about the positions of the planets, and they also give us the notion that um, predicting is hard because measurement is perfect measurement is impossible. Another kind of systems are the complex systems. You must have heard about them before. Also, many biological systems look like complex systems. And you would have encountered the definition potentially in the past. Complex systems are uh, defined as a system of interacting simpler parts. Now, to what, to what extent these simpler parts are simpler? One often uh, shared example about complex systems are ant colonies. Now, an ant is a particularly complex system just by itself. You look at the ant, it's like almost infinite complexity in the ants, so like as many organisms. But it turns out that if you symbolize the behavior of ants uh, according to certain basic principles, you can explain a lot of the colony's behaviors without having to assume all the biological complexity. So you have interacting little ants uh, and they, uh, they have observable phenomena. I'll tell you the anecdote. So people found out that looking into ant nests that they had little ant cemeteries. So bodies of ants were actually in specific cham chambers into, in, the, in the nest. People were wondering, like, how do the nest, how do the ants know how to create a cemetery? Do they decide that this is a good room for the cemetery? Um, turns out that the, the rule for cemetery formation in the case of ants is rather simple. What the ant does, uh, and can be explained by, um, what the ant does is ant loiters around in a nest and, you know, goes about its usual business. When it finds a dead ant, it picks it up. And then it carries it on and on and on um, until it finds another dead end and then it drops it. So this you can see in your mind's eye that will create an accumulation of dead ants in a specific place, right? And so typical complex system behavior, a, si a simple set of rules explaining an emergent behavior. And then we have the complex dynamical adaptive systems, such as the brain or the cell, right? Things that absorb the influences of the environment and transform them via their inter simpler interacting pieces into, uh, into adaptive behavior, into the behavior that is well matched with the environment. So this gradient between dynamical systems, complex systems and complex adaptive systems is the reason why we're studying dynamical systems now is because the views in, uh, afforded by the first steps into this theoretical framework will give you enormous insight about uh, the entire spectrum of life and particularly it provides a vocabulary that describes phenomena across many temporal and spatial scales that allows us to describe phenomena in similar ways um, we can then talk about cosmological phenomena and quantum phenomena, sometimes in similar vocabularies. You've noticed before that some models apply in many different scales. The Nimple systems embodies this, uh, this notion. It explains similarities across seemingly disparate phenomena. It gives powerful intuitions about how complex and adaptive behavior can emerge from simple rules. I just give you an example now. There are many, many other examples. It explains many the guises of pattern formation. And pattern formation is so important for function. It uses the concepts of symmetry breaking or bifurcations um, uh, and abrupt transitions. And it tries to explain how order arise, arises from what otherwise would see would seem like maximally entropic systems, completely homogeneous. And it would also explain emergence of dynamical phenomena, such as oscillations, waves, propagations, and, uh, um, and so forth and so on. 
Now, what are these dynamical phenomena that I was referring to? So these are the words that by the end of this course are going to be, it's kind of like you, know, you speak English, you speak Dutch, you speak your other uh, languages, and now you're going to speak dynamical systems. And this is dynamical uh, systems lingo. Attractors, bistability, bifurcations, hysteresis, limit cycles, per periodicity or aperiodicity and synchronization. Those are uh, the essences, um, the essential terms that we're going to be using here. This is just a component of a larger spectrum. This is a um, picture of complex systems in general, and you will see here nonlinear dynamics and systems theory close together with pattern formation, evolution adaptation, after collective behavior, and game theory. So all of these components, many of which are going to be present in this course, beautifully mingle with each other. It's almost impossible to actually create these circles because there are so many possible uh, connections for these complex systems. I'll share, you, uh, share these slides with you so that you can uh, take some time to look deeper into some of these terms. It would be interesting for you to now look at these and see how many of these words you have an intuitive understanding now, how many of these words are new to you, and then do the same thing in eight weeks from now, in which then you will have a completely different view of what the word chaos means, for example, or you will have a different way to think about homeostasis, potentially, and even uh, clearly also uh, pattern formation and so forth. Just a few of the ways. History is important, also for science. So this is a picture of the timeline of the study of complex systems. So you see how young, for a scientific discipline, how young this all is. And obviously computers helped, right? So no simulations means like we can't have many of these insights from, uh, from emergence before we can compute with many pieces. Um, and so systems science, I mean, they, they do have their small beginnings in the likes of uh, Isaac Newton and Henri Poincaré. We're going to be talking about Poincaré quite a bit. The, um, and uh, cybernetics, a word that might have gotten a different uh, meaning over, over the years, but is imminently related with artificial intelligence onset. Connectionism. So the idea of using artificial neural networks to represent cognitive brain function is related to the ideas in cybernetics and so cybernetics. And so it might be interesting if you have the heart of a hist uh, hist historian of science to have a look at how these threads combine and, and talk to each other. Might be a nice way to do some YouTube video searches rather than just getting YouTube to provide to you what are the uh, 10 most recent videos, look into some of the stuff that, uh, that underlies the modern knowledge. Um, and so these terms here will give you some interesting hits. Um, things like swarm behavior and emergence have been introduced in the 80s. So you see uh, this is all pretty uh pretty young and now here big data right so you're you're here and you're uh, looking into also ethics and policy because you want the world to take into account those ideas also applied complexity here here's us uh using some uh applied complexity uh, theory for education uh and so where are we going right now I hope I will see you taking this forward. Here's a, a sampler of examples transforming complexity from simplicity. So in ants, you have colonies with complex behavior and they emerge, things, things emerge like cemeteries. Neurons in, are simpler than thoughts. One would like to think, I mean, so neurons can spike or not. Uh, and thought is this multidimensional, multifaceted 
full of pictures and patterns at this idea, this set of ideas. One person doesn't need to, democracy. Many people do need some sort of uh, organizational system that emerges from us, right? And the properties of politics are often also properties of dynamical systems. In fact, there is a model published in science about uh, how bipolar beliefs emerge in a system that is catalyzed by social media. You can argue with the model, but at least it's there for, uh, for you to look into. Uh, amoeba produce aggregates or the slime molds um, produce complex fruiting bodies. Cows, herd, fireflies can produce synchrony. I don't know if you knew, but some fireflies do blink synchronously. We're going to talk about that in the last week. Now, the characteristics that transform simplicity into complexity are here, the, the, fundamental, uh, the fundamental insights that we want to cater for with the projects. So the projects are supposed to be giving us these, uh, the ability for your brain to catch on these. So how is it that nonlinearities imply sometimes irreducibility? How is it that in, Comple complex systems create in what does it mean to be emergent? What is a phase transition in that context? Uh, how do things self-organize? In which ways can they self-organize? What is criticality? Uh, and how is it that uh, some history, uh, the history of interactions and the history of experience of a substrate creates a path dependence? that makes us individuals in a sense like we're all humans we're all similar um but we are all different and what makes us different is experience and genes and experience like at the broadest sense so there's enormous path dependency here so we're balancing out uh complexity and simplicity by understanding uh, by you making recourse to these terms To be a bit more concrete, uh, the patterns that are created from the dynamics of systems and com uh, complex systems um, are many and they have functions. Let me talk a little bit about not the disembodied pattern formation, but the very tangible um, functions that certain patterns can perform. So if you see a tree in the back of your mind, you're thinking, well, I mean, so something is taking something from the from the ground all the way to the leaf. It has something to do with circulation and transport, right? Uh, but also, if you see something in a tree shape, it can be a crack. I mean, like a crack in a crystal has a tree shape, or a river has a you know has this kind of branching shape, especially as it is coming close to the delta crevice. Are there similarities between these patterns? The dude, what functions do they have? Um, we can talk about waves and we can talk about propagation um, through waves, also transport, uh, creation of texture and potentially different skin absorption properties. Um, you could think about them. Um, you see spirals uh, in the heart, uh, in the propagation of contractions uh, in the heart, especially when it's not, um, as a especially when it's healthy. You see spirals in the slime mold, you see uh, spirals in chemistry. Um, you see helicoid, helicoidal patterns in the, the stomach of sharks. Uh, you, say, you see helicoids in DNAs and in shells. You see things clumping up like in clusters as, uh, as in cell differentiation, segregation, bubbles, have also function. They can become cell membranes, they can become eggs, they enclose certain ideas. So these are the functions of patterns. So this, this is to give you the idea that even we might, even though we might describe abstractly the creation of a pattern, in the back of your minds, when you're dealing with the real problem, you should also be thinking about the em em uh, embodied function it performs. Let me discuss a few of these examples quickly, okay? So these are trees. Um, 
which one is the cell and which one is the galaxy? If I phrase it like this, it's probably easy, right? <laughs> so which one is the, which one are neurons and which one are light years? We would like to know whether the generating processes uh, may or may not be similar. Are there some rules that might unify the two or not? Um, so some pattern analogies are superficial and some pattern analogies are more profound. In branches and trees, I mean, in, this, in these ones, these pattern similarities are, are uh, very striking. On the left here, you see a Purkinje cell, Purkinje neuron in the cerebellum. Uh, it's a flat neuron. And that flat neuron receives information. Oh, let's see, I like I raised my hand and recognized my gesture. Um, it receives neuron. It receives input from orthogonally shooting through fibers. Then you see uh, the fan coral that positions itself orthogonally to the flow of nutrients in a water stream. And you have the three-dimensional branching pattern of the lungs that are acquiring oxygen from a fractal amount of alveoli. So trying to maximize the absorption uh, surface of the, uh, um, of the inner lungs. They grow, right? Uh, so let me turn off my... And uh, there are some analogies and metaphors we can extract from the perspective of, say, information collecting or, or collection uh, in all of these. And there might also be generating mechanisms that inspire us to think about uh, one or the other. We can sometimes even generalize them. And now, first time I saw this picture uh, in the internet, it's a moving picture. I mean, the birds give it off, but uh, these clusters of, of breathing trees, right? Like, uh, I first thing I thought was uh, alveoli, and uh, and these are not alveoli, and definitely they're not moving like that in the lungs. But you can. Uh, the point here is the the ways in which they clump um, might share some properties with the ways in which alveoli clump also in the lungs. And talking about sharing properties, a simple model of making a tree could include just a few simple rules, such as you start with the root and you produce, produce a certain growth in a certain direction with a certain probability. And then you terminate uh, a new branch with another probability. So for every single step, uh, you acquire, uh, you make a decision about what you're going to do next. And so with a certain probability, you might branch. Uh, and with a certain probability, you might uh, stop. Now, let me generate one of these neurons for you on the fly, if my computer allows me. Okay. No? Strange. Huh. I wanted to, to, to show you. Oh no, what happened? It's all grayed out. Okay. Uh, I'll move on with another example that is not mine. I'll see if uh, I can show this to you later. Um, these types of small beginnings also give us ways to explain very complex patterns that, that uh, are uh, very geometrical in nature. You might have run across the Romanesco broccoli in your favorite grocery store. And this is a model of the formation of the Romanesco broccoli. And you will be happy to hear that it has to do with the Fibonacci series and also pineapples, surprisingly, maybe even Christmas trees. Um, simple rules. Transmit. This is actually a picture of real biology. This is a real Romanesco broccoli, right? It applying its own rules recursively because of what it is. It expresses uh, complex uh, geometrical patterns. 
that are fractal in nature. That's another term that we're going to be hearing a lot uh, about here in the course, like particularly after um, uh, the fourth session, we're going to be studying some properties of fractals and thinking about what makes a fractal and why is it that the Romanesco broccoli um, looks that much like a fractal. You will see that there are differences between reality and the theoretical abstractions that we use, but that the overlap between the reality and the theoretical abstractions uh, is very uh, compelling for a, a number of scales. You've seen waves as well. Uh, so here's another side-by-side -side example. And in this case, the theory underlying the pattern formation for both is the same. Um, so you would be allowed to guess which one is chemistry and which one is biology. Um, but clearly uh, now seeing this unfolding in your screen, it gives you the sense that uh, this is too fast to be biology, even though it's actually uh, faster than uh, faster than real time. This is about, I think, four times faster than real time. This is the bilozov zabotinsky reaction, which produces an oscillatory, um, on, uh, a, an oscillatory reaction that transforms the reactants and the reagent into each other in a loop. And if you spread it out in space, they produce then these propagating spirals outwardly. On the right, you have the diastelium um, slime mold. And uh, up to a certain uh, point, so the, the theory that we use to explain this pattern formation is um, reaction diffusion. You might have stumbled upon it in your previous studies, and um, you will see more about waves and synchrony and pattern formation uh, towards, the, towards the course and, protect, uh, and potentially also for your final project. So this is a dictyostelium. Uh, let me see how long this is, because these are CAMP waves. I mean, they're probably hard to see, but the, these are uh, cyclic uh, AMP um, and dictyostelium, like recorded in real time. It was the best video I could find. I'm sure that nowadays there is a nanobiology uh, teacher potentially doing this. Uh, and then you can see this pattern formation, I don't know if you're familiar. Uh, so first it produces the waves and then it tessellates the space. It tessellates the space in a Voronoi pattern, V-O-R-O-N-O-I, Voronoi patterns, very famous. And so these will become the fruiting bodies of the dictyostelium. So the dictyostelium is more complex than just the chemistry of the oscillatory reaction. It does a little bit of the oscillatory reaction and then it kind of coalesces into, uh, into this more complex pattern. Now, this more, the whole life cycle of the dictyostelium is what we would like to explain, right? We would like to be able to model the entire thing. Uh, we have been able to model here the left part of these, uh, of these phenomena. Now, we haven't yet been able to model the culmination and the fruiting body, but this is, you know, Closing the cycle. Hopefully, we will have a uh, a model that, that is able to give us the entire uh, spectrum that covers the entire life cycle of the dictyostelium. I don't know if you've seen this before. It's just a bit mind-boggling. You know that these uh, these are not single-celled. Um, this is not a multicellular organism. It's, it's single-cellular organisms that are. Um, clumping up and forming this fruiting body that will propagate the spores. It looks like a multicellular organism, but it is an, a, an arrangement of a number of unicellular organisms that operate according to hopefully simple rules to produce complex behavior. Uh, computer models, right? They can do it. That's what I mentioned before. And uh, then we can study it. I mean, it's not only about them and they can do it in different uh, scenarios with hearts, and uh, you have some propagating waves here. Uh, so the, uh, this is 
work by uh, some colleagues in the University of Washington, I believe. Uh, so yeah, these are propagating, uh, this is a model, the fitz nagumo model of an oscillation in the contraction and relaxation of the individual um, muscle cells in the heart. And uh, this is, these are basically happy hearts uh, where you have these, uh, these wave propagations. I think that these are rabbit hearts, I'm not sure, 100%. And then you can study similarities and, and, uh, and differences between uh, the simulation and experiment and, it, and then play. Because if you have a simulation, the beauty is, uh, if you have a simulation, you have a model. And if you have a model, you have parameters. Here you have the reaction diffusion equation on the right side that is parameterized by a certain uh, a certain uh, set of parameters. For, for example, some injected uh, injected current, and you have here uh, the um, or injected uh, ACE uh, uh, catalyst. Uh, then you have parameters A and B and as a function of those parameters A and B, you may or may not see the dynamics of the um, of the pattern for formation. You can then study what's the dependence of the parameters on the probability that you will see a pattern against the theory, knowing that then, yes, biology is full of variation, but at least there is a rule, a law that biology is trying to follow. And you can then use the fraction of uh, cyclic A and B receptors, for example, to, uh, to uh, and via the external cyclic A and P concentration to study which are the regions within which this uh, setting will form. And then you can tamper with genes, for example, and you can create a knockout of a cell uh, that will modify some of these parameters and then potentially disrupt the pattern formation, transforming the organism from the one that did, did the spirals to the one that did not do the spirals. And maybe the one that did not do, do the spirals has some uh, fundamental differences. I actually, um, I think this is a, a study or a, basically this is a, a picture from the previous study in which they did a genetic model to to uh, to try to pinpoint the fundamental molecular contributions on the, uh, on the pattern formation of dictyostelium. stealing. So tiny little amounts sometimes, right? So you, you change your gene per person. Um, or you change the concentration smoothly, but at one point, the pattern starts appearing. Now, it's already 45 minutes. I plan to, to go for, uh, for five more. You've encountered cellular automata before. This is just to give you uh, a few more uh, views of the ways in which simple rules express themselves in reality. So you can see the, the shell, actually, that's that's a picture of mine. That's a shell I found in the Brazilian beach. And on the right side is um, one of the one dimensional cellular automata by Wolfram that has a class four, which is an aperiodic class. Now, they're not identical, but they are strongly reminiscent. In fact, I think that you can probably create something like the, the left one. You just have to figure out what the rules are. And the rules can produce a, a grand variety of patterns. And if you do this in two dimensions, I mean, you have seen Game of Life before, and I'm going to just leave you with one metaphor. There's music in this one, so I hope that the volume is not too loud. Thank you. 
you should be asking yourselves, what do you think you'll see at the next level? We're zooming out of uh, the two-dimensional Conway's game of life. The title gives it off. The title of the slide gives it off, of course. So is life computational? Is reality deterministic? Like, is life <laughs> expressing patterns like from the smallest to, to the largest scales? Are the rules present in different uh, in different levels? So this is a glider, and the glider is a little computational entity that it propagates, like seems like it's propagating in this very simplified model of life. Now this is maybe, you know, a, just a digital analogy, but it's to get our brains thinking about how is it that very simple rules, maybe quantile level, maybe just above, carry on expressing their own properties at, uh, at higher and higher levels, even to the point of you creating the emergence of the functions of brains, such as computation. So brains compute, but they compute with ultimately the matter of the universe. We are the mud that stood, stood up. So that matter of the universe that is inside our heads somehow creates emergent computation. I can calculate, you know, so you can calculate. And <coughs> calculation is computation. Computation emerges from matter, but matter is computational, or is it? Yeah. One more example uh, of a cute one. So I like this one because it's more continuous. Uh, it's a um, modern version of the game of life in which there are some other rules, but uh, it's just, you know, you can also play with these ideas. Uh, this is what I wanted to um, to give back to you as, as we wrap this, uh, this session up. I want you to think about jovially about modeling with dynamical systems. I want you to explore ideas and be creative to, to think about, oh, well, how could it possibly be? I mean, if people say it's not exactly like reality, it's okay, it's okay. Sometimes it's okay. You're just exploring, you're thinking, you're trying to try different, different things. Who knows, might actually see discovery. I think that this is a, a, a you know, a continuous version of, of the game of life with, with partial differential equations. If you're curious, uh, you can, uh, I can give you some reference. Uh, and clearly, you know, uh, this is the entire spectrum. This is, this is the last uh, element here. Would we be able to, via playing with models and, and trying to discover which are the fundamental aspects of complexity, go from the egg to the embryo, right? So is, is, this, is, this is the question. To tell you that, you know, this is also central for your study, uh, dynamical systems uh, view of st stem cell biology a few years back in science uh, has done this analogy very explicitly and so that's why I grabbed their, their figures. Uh, here uh, in A you see a energy landscape. Um, stem cell can take one of many paths, type 1, type 2, type 3, uh, and that fate is a function of the stem cells here in red and the function of the expression of protein, protein A, B, and C, for instance, <laughs> and the three wells in which they can uh, fall, right? Differentiation wells, so to speak. And this can be explained by the interaction of a smaller number of genes. So I feel that this is a very compelling way to think about differentiation and pattern formation too. And that's why I wanted to share it with you. So the lecture, this lecture today was actually about patterns, right? More than uh, dynamical systems in general to give you a broad sense of why these projects that we're giving to you 
are relevant. I mean, like you will look at this from many perspectives. You will be helped by some of the greatest YouTubers out there. Uh, so three blue, one brown uh, in Veritasium uh, are great sources for this type of material that you're going to be learning here. In fact, I already added a Veritasium video because I didn't know if I was going to be feeling well enough today in the morning to give you this lecture. So I thought, well, I might, uh, might as well uh, you know, give you a 20 minutes uh, fun video for this, which you can still watch, still in Brightspace in week one, so as under watch. And that will also embody the uh, principles of the first project. Now, it's 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to finish this, uh, this uh, part of the lecture and then we're going to discuss the, uh, uh, the class constraints. This summarizes what I said before. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize for the last time is that the rules that we're trying to discover in models are imminent in matter, starting like at the uh, at the elemental particles, uh, but in their interaction that is rule based, even if it is quantum, even if it is uh, if you cannot measure it and predict, how, nevertheless. Quantile particles interact in a number of specified ways, and they have internal constraints. And those constraints are then get, getting expressed at the, at the uh, next levels. The laws of reality imply time, imply dynamics, imply entropy, imply temperature. Interactions, <laughs> for the most particles, uh, are local. And so, you know, it's neighbors talking to each other, producing some uh, some gradients or creating like a certain environment. So for pattern formation, um, there is a path dependency. So where it's going to land, it's a bit how it started, but there's still similarity because the laws are similar. The phase transitions create uh, the analogies uh, at the pattern level. And it's not only form, it's form and function. So think about what there's, there's relationships are. When you see a pattern in reality, think about those. Okay. Uh, I just noticed that the, this mistake, uh, there is uh, an oddity here. Um, since 922, um, that means that I've been lecturing for 15 minutes. I think that it might be good if you know uh, we, we we stop this for a moment. You take your coffee and we reconvene in say fifteen minutes from now. So nine, uh, say nine thirty-five, and then I tell you how the day looks like. And very soon you're going to be able to work on on your projects. We're going to be talking about um, the materials you're going to going to have uh, for this, and you know final projects and things like that. Okay. And, and you know, opening for questions also through uh, through my TAs. Okay. I have to change the slide. Early it starts at 8.30. Yeah. I'm gonna change the audio from speaking out loud to just on uh, I heard speaking yeah, out I loud in the uh, second my, thing you said. Right because I cannot yeah. connect it. Wait, I have to raise my own volume. What did you say? Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Ah, perfect. All right. That was actually really nice. I'd like to um, be in the back.